Hello, welcome. You hearing me all right through the mic? Welcome to the Penn Humanities Forum. I'm Jim English, director of the forum. It's great to have another nearly full house for, uh, this is the fifth event in our series on the topic of color. I want to thank the co-sponsors of tonight's event, the Department of Anthropology, chaired by Greg Urban, and the Department of Biology, chaired by Brenda Casper. Um, our audience this evening includes faculty and students from those two departments, also from chemistry, from dermatology, history, art history, film, literature, and of course from many walks of life beyond the walls of the academy. Uh, this is partly a tribute to our speaker, Nina Jablonski, whose, uh, whose work is uh, wide-ranging and path-breaking. By the way, Professor Jablonski's um, books, uh, Skin and Living Color, are both um, for sale out on the table in the lobby. Um, if you uh, would like to pick up a copy, um, sumptuously illustrated, the uh, living color, by the way. Um, but the range of interest here is also an index of our commitment at the forum to a capacious idea of the humanities, to an understanding of humanistic inquiry as interwoven with and a crucial partner to science, medicine, law, and other supposedly ro remote domains. Our final event this semester on December 10th features two innovative, multi-award winning scholars at Penn, Shu Yang and Dan Jansen, in conversation with the historian of science, John Tresh, about how butterfly wings are guiding new research on aesthetics, evolution, and engineering. And next semester, we have a film series on the new black cinematography, lectures on the urban politics of green environmentalism, the rise of the Asian American chef and um, ethnic oat cuisine, or is it oat ethnic cuisine? Um, public art in Philadelphia, the mural arts project will be here. Um, the neuroscience of synesthesia and more. Capacious, as I say, but coherent and purposeful, as I think you'll appreciate if you've been a regular attendant thus far. The mastermind of this series is my talented colleague, Chi Ming Yang, associate professor of English, a scholar of 18th century literature and culture, Professor Young is a specialist in East-West commerce and cultural trade, colonial science, and yes, modern European theories of color in their relation to the politics of race. Professor Young will introduce our distinguished speaker, Nina Jablonski. Thank you, Jim, and welcome everyone. Um, I know we're all very excited for tonight's lecture on the colors of human skin. Um, and this event also is a very nice lead up to, as Jim was saying, our final um, event of the fall series um, on butterfly, the colors of butterfly skins. Um, and it really is a powerhouse panel of distinguished pen professors, so I hope you'll join us on December 10. Tonight we are very lucky to have with us um, Nina Jablonski, the Evan Pugh Professor of Anthropology at Penn State University. Professor Jablonski leads a new wave of scholars who are turning to the interface of medicine and the humanities, studying the biology and history of skin as a colored surface that shapes our bodies, our health, our identities, and cultures. Professor Jablonski's training in paleontology gives her an invaluably long view of the question of human diversity. And the range of her projects bespeaks her versatility and her impact as a public intellectual. Her books, Living Color, The Biological and Social Meaning of Skin Color from 2012, and Skin, A Natural History from 2006, are widely cited and important works um, in a number of fields, ranging from critical race studies to public health. She is also involved with projects that bring the science of genetics into school curricula and with important initiatives like the effects of race in South Africa. So please uh, join me in welcoming to Penn, um, UPenn that is, uh, Nina Jablonski. Thank you.
Thank you, Chi Ming. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. I'm delighted to be here this evening. Thank you for coming out on an early wintry night to talk about one of the most fascinating subjects that one could talk about in the field of anthropology or simply the field of the study of the human organism. People have been interested in the colors of their own skin and the colors of other people's skins for a very long time. I became interested in this topic around 25 years ago, and I have been, because of my background as an anthropologist, interested primarily in how the diversity of skin colors evolved and is a product of evolution. And then, in the last 15 years especially, I've become interested not only in how the colors evolved and diversified, but why they have come to be valued in the ways that they have in the last 500 years. What I would like to spin for you tonight is a story, an anthropological story, of evolution and human attitudes. And so I hope that you'll take mental notes and get ready to ans or ask lots of questions at the end. I want you to think about your own skin and its meaning. Sorry. In popular culture in the last 30 years, people have become more excited about talking about the diversity of skin tones, largely because there has been so much deliberate thought given to what skin tones mean to us in this country and elsewhere. In Byron Kinn's 1993, momentous work, Synecdoche, he paints carefully the colors of the skin of people that he actually knows. In a momentous work beginning in the 19, late 1980s, Brazilian artist Angelica Das, in her Humani project, uses Pantone colors to describe the varied colors of the people around her in Brazil with the explicit thesis that this project, her Humani project, is a chromatic inventory. Oops, oops, oop, oh dear, sorry. I'm trying to get the pointer, there we go. A chromatic inventory, a project that reflects on the colors beyond the borders of our codes by referencing the Pantone color system. We'll get to the codes that we have used to describe skin color toward the end of this lecture. But one of the things that Angelica has done is to beautifully capture the tremendous variety of the sepia rainbow that characterizes the human species and that beautifully characterizes this audience tonight. When we look at her entire collection of, of portraits, it is astounding in its diversity and beauty. She and Kim are looking at this from the perspective of modern diversity, in, especially in urban environments. What I began an interest in is, like many explorers of past ages and anthropologists, the diversity of humans as we see geographically. By the beginning of the 18th century, it was quite well known that there was a distribution of differently colored people around the world. With, and this, this plate comes from my book, Living Color, that Jim uh, and Chi Ming discussed. Uh, this plate shows the beautiful distribution of skin colors in a range of women in the old and new world. What this map shows and other similar maps show, is that we find the most 
darkly pigmented people closer to the equator and the most lightly pigmented people living closer to the poles. This distribution has been appreciated for a long time, but actually was summarized in maps similar to this beginning in the 18th, especially in the 19th, and even more completely in the 20th centuries. So this distribution invited natural historians and philosophers to speculate on why it existed. And the most, even some of the most casual observers realized that this distribution of skin pigmentation had to do with the intensity of the sun. And we see in ancient Greece and in the ancient Mediterranean world a series of, of philosophers talking about the meaning of skin color. And they noted the, as did Avicenna or Ibn Sina, the very famous Islam, Islamic natural historian and medic, who said, this is a wonderful series of quotes, people living excessive distance from the sun lack keenness of understanding and clarity of intelligence, while those experiencing long presence of the sun at the zenith have the temperaments hot and their humors fiery, their color black, and their hair woolly. What was recognized here is that there was a relationship between the intensity of the sun and the darkness or lightness of the skin, but also something that we take from ancient Greece into 18th and 19th century science, a relationship between the intensity of the sun and the temperament of the people living under it. We will revisit this climatic theory of human temperaments a little bit later. Our modern scientific understanding of skin color and the gradient of skin pigmentation really can be traced to Stan Samuel Stanhope Smith in the mid 18th and early 19th centuries, who observed the gradation of color holds a more regular progression according to its latitude from the equator. And basically, since then, we have been refining our understanding and trying to understand why this relationship exists. Now, as an evolutionary biologist, I face the real challenge of trying to reconstruct how an organism, a human organism here, with a close relative here, our last common ancestor six to seven million years ago, how a primate evolved the skin that it did. You can see a challenge immediately. Skin itself is rarely preserved in the archeological or paleontological records for more than a few thousand years. And so what we must rely on for the most part is the comparative method when we try to determine the evolutionary sequence of events oops, that led from the common ancestor of chimps and humans to modern humans in their varied colors today. What we have going for us is not just the comparative anatomy and physiology of the 20th and 19th centuries, we also have comparative molecular biology and genomics today. And these multi-pronged approaches now make it possible for us to understand a lot of what was going on in the soft tissues of the body, including the skin, during our course of evolution. And one of the things that I'm compressing here a tremendous amount of research into a very short uh, space of time. One of the things that we've come to appreciate is that our skin, the skin of our common ancestor with chimpanzees, I should say, probably was very similar to that of modern chimps today. The common ancestor was hairy. The common ancestor had skin that was light at birth, and when individuals were young, but the developed darkness or pigmentation as a result of sun exposure during, during life. 
When you look underneath the hair of a chimpanzee or another close primate relative, what you see is lightly pigmented skin covered by dark hair. And this is the ancestral condition for our lineage. And where we really became different is when we lost most of our covering of hair and started living in more open environments running, striding, living, making a living in more open environments, we lost our hair and dramatic changes in skin color resulted. So that by the time we discover, not this is the royal we, I didn't discover this beautiful fossil, it was discovered by my colleague Alan Walker uh, nearly 40 years ago at the west side of Lake Turkana in western Kenya. This beautiful specimen of early Homo erectus was a very, very tall, nimble young man, estimated to be about nine years old at the time of his death, very modern in his limb proportions compared to some of the earlier ape-like ancestors that were in our lineage, very modern in his mode of locomotion. He was a striding, running, active biped that engaged in a lot of heated, literally heated running in open environments. Under these conditions, humans evolved naked skin in order to liberate excess heat from the surface of their bodies. And as soon as we lost our protective covering of fur, we had to compensate for it in a variety of ways. And one of the ways in which we compensated for the sun screening properties of fur was to build in natural sunscreen into our skin. Melanin pigment, permanent melanin pigment, not just tan, became a feature of human bodies about 1.2 million years ago, according to the best uh, evolutionary genomic reconstruction. And since then, individuals evolving in Africa including the earliest members of our species, Homo sapiens, have been darkly pigmented. This is our ancestral condition, and the ancestral condition of dark pigmentation was incredibly important to our survival under hot, intensely sunny, and very strong ultraviolet radiation regimes. I became really interested in the evolution of skin pigmentation um, because for the first time in the late 20th century, there were new bodies of data that allowed us to gain new insight into why human skin pigmentation may have evolved in the patterns that it did. Prior to about the year 2000, or 1995 at the earliest, most scientists trying to look at this had to get data on solar radiation from a few isolated direct monitoring observatories. But beginning in the mid-90s, and certainly by the, by the year 2000, what was available was reams, buckets, bushels, terabytes of, of data from remotely sensed NASA satellites. This changed the game entirely because it allowed us for the first time to visualize the intensity of the sun and the intensity of ultraviolet radiation throughout the, th throughout the year and over the Earth's surface. This nice map shows annual average ultraviolet radiation taken from the NASA TOMS uh, remote sensing data satellite. This map was created by my husband, George Chaplin, who has been my primary collaborator on this work. And he is responsible for all the beautiful maps that you see here, as well as the statistics behind all of the maps. But one of the things that we must draw attention to is the fact that ultraviolet radiation has a pronounced geographic pattern. These hot 
pink and red areas are the areas of highest UV. You can see in those areas of high UV are in the driest areas, continental areas here in Africa and in South America, as well as over the mid-ocean. And then there are some continental areas, like here, tropical Brazil, with lots of humidity and cloud and rainfall, equatorial West Africa, Southeast Asia, that although at the equator have somewhat lower levels of ultraviolet radiation. And then as we go in toward the poles, we get incrementally much, much lower levels of, of sunlight. What is key here is that there is a huge part of the northern hemisphere that receives very little ultraviolet radiation, or at least sort of important ultraviolet radiation, that is UVB, or medium wavelength ultraviolet radiation during the course of the year. And this has had a remarkable effect on the evolution of human skin pigmentation as humans dispersed into these environments through time. Just so that you know, I've done my sums. In our published papers on the evolution of skin pigmentation, we collected data from many, many publications from populations all over the world whose skin pigmentation had been measured using a skin reflectance measuring device. When we analyzed all those skin reflectance data against the UV data set from NASA, we were able to see that there was a very, very high correlation and that we can conclude that 86% of the total variation in all skin pigmentation amongst indigenous peoples can be accounted for by ultraviolet radiation. And this is this is this far outstrips any temperature or humidity or other physical effect. So ultraviolet radiation is fascinating stuff. You hear about it from the meteorologist or from your dermatologist. It is fascinating because mostly it is screened out by our atmosphere, our protective layer of ozone and oxygen around the Earth's surface. The shortest and most dangerous wavelengths, UVC, are screened out entirely. UVB wavelengths are mostly screened out. So here, if we're at the equator, at the vernal or the autumnal equinox, we'll get no UVC, but a moderate amount of UVB going straight through the atmosphere. And then a really lavish amount of UVA, which is long wavelength ultraviolet radiation passing directly through the, the atmosphere along with visible light. Keep this image in your, uh, in your mind's eye because I'll show you a contrasting one in just a moment. When people began to think about why skin pigmentation evolved in the pattern that it did, they said, well, what does ultraviolet radiation do that's so bad? Why would skin have to protect itself from excess ultraviolet radiation? Or why would some skin not need to be protected? And the earliest thesis was that this had to be related to skin color, that ultraviolet radiation caused damage to the DNA in the skin and caused skin cancer, rather. But this hypothesis was shot down very quickly for the good reason that most skin cancers develop in people after their reproductive years. Evolution doesn't work on old people, right? I mean, with all due respect, <laughs> evolution works on people who are reproductively active and it works through the mechanism of differential reproductive success. And so we had to seek a mechanism that would actually affect reproductive success, and skin cancer wasn't it. And so what we realized, and this was something of an insight that I had uh, in the mid early 1990s, was that ultraviolet radiation profoundly affected a key vitamin, folate, one of the B vitamin groups, that is essential for making DNA, and DNA is essential for all cell division in your body, especially important for pregnant women and men of reproductive age who are actively making sperm. 
if you don't have enough of folate, this essential B vitamin that you get from green vegetables, citrus fruits, whole grains, this, this kind of thing, if you don't have enough folate, you can't make enough DNA to repair normal wear and tear of cells or to make new cells. And it became clear in the 1980s that women with folate deficiencies often gave rise to infants with severe birth defects. And so the penny dropped, almost literally, when I realized that there might be a connection between ultraviolet radiation, folate, and reproductive success. And so just quickly here, a, a little embryology lesson. This is you at three weeks of gestation. You're just this little tiny ball of cells beginning to, to differentiate into uh, major systems, organ systems in the body. Your primordial nervous system starts to develop at 21 days. And before you know it, in the blink of an eye, in embryonic terms, in four to five days, you have complete formation of the neural tube, the primordium of the brain and the spinal cord. This process requires rapid and precise cell division fueled by DNA production, in turn fueled by ample uh, supplies of folate, which, if interrupted, can result in a, in a flaw of varying severity in this process. So our hypothesis was that if you want to protect the human organism against the effects of ultraviolet radiation, you interpose a sunscreen between the sun and the blood flowing through the skin. And what you do is you recruit a sunscreen, a, a, almost a physical pair of sunglasses, a special molecule that will have sunscreening effects. Melanin, specifically the molecule eumelanin, is a remarkable molecule. We all have it in our skin to varying amounts. Eumelanin is the consummate natural sunscreen of the natural world. It is used in a variety of mammals and other vertebrates and invertebrates, and we even find forms of it in some fungi and other, uh, other sort of lower life forms. It is one of these things that has been used by evolution because it works. And it works because it can absorb the energy of ultraviolet radiation. It has a big, long polymer chain. This is just a little part of it here. As ultraviolet radiation from the sun impinges on eumelanin, it uncoils a little bit. It, and the ultraviolet radiation loses its energy and cannot penetrate farther into the skin, or very little of it can penetrate into the skin if you have a lot of eumelanin in your skin. So this was a natural thing to have happened. There were mutations present in our ancestors that allowed eumelanin production to be turned on all the time, not just when the sun was shining, but all the time. Permanent pigmentation became part of our bodies. My colleague who works with us in the field in East Turkana has beautiful darkly pigmented skin. When he is out in the sun uh, helping us, he develops an even more robust tan than he otherwise has. His skin darkens. Mine darkens a little bit under intense sun, but under the withering sun of equatorial Africa, it quickly burns. His does not. And he will continue to produce melanin uh, in his skin. And that melanin serves as a tremendous barrier to most ultraviolet radiation. And fascinatingly, there's still a little bit that penetrates. And I'll get to that in a minute. So when we look at, at what I call the, the hairy timeline of human evolution, here from, from our humble beginnings around six million years ago, the common ancestor with chimpanzees, we had lightly pigmented skin covered by dark hair. We lose most of our body hair, although we retain head hair and a few other clumps here and there. By about 1.2 million years, we are darkly pigmented and our lineage 
grading into Homo sapiens in Africa becomes very darkly pigmented. By the time Homo sapiens is, is, has, has evolved 200,000 years ago, has emerged as a species, as a modern species, we are darkly pigmented. During most of Homo sapiens evolution, between 200,000 and 60,000 years, that 100 and, uh, 140 or so thousand years of evolution, during which Homo sapiens was developing tremendously rich material culture, linguistic diversity, in just enormous variations as it, as it migrated and ramified throughout Africa. We were entirely an African species in varying shades of dark brown. Our history outside of Africa begins around 70,000 years ago with some small populations leaving Africa at that time. Not that there was any particular reason to leave, except people needed to follow the foods that were available. And the history of humans has been following foods and following opportunities, not with any particular goal in mind, but simply to survive. So what we're going to do now is have a quick tour of hum modern human evolution to try to figure out how the beautiful, diverse colors of the human skin palette evolved. As I mentioned, around 200,000 years ago, we see the first members of Homo sapiens emerging from fossil ancestors in Africa, darkly pigmented people, highly sophisticated tool culture, material culture that becomes through time increasingly more sophisticated as we see through stone tools and by 72,000 years ago as we see through beads, ochre plaques and other pieces of material culture. By 60,000 years ago, extremely varied and diverse material culture and rock art throughout much of Africa. Around 70, 60 to 70,000 years ago, we see a few populations entering the Afro-Arabian Peninsula and then going along southern coastal routes into Asia, East Asia and Southeast Asia, and into Western Europe and Central Europe. A key point here is that the populations leaving Africa and the Afro-Arabian Peninsula were small. This is a genetic bottleneck point in human history that was extreme. Our genetic variability was very, very small for the populations leaving here so that the ancestors of modern East, Southeast Asians and South Asians and modern Europeans actually originated from a constrained genetic population here something that has tremendous importance that we won't dwell on tonight, but is a very, very fascinating problem. By 40,000 years ago, we have humans uh, ramifying and diversifying through, throughout East Asia, and then about 20,000 years ago, getting into Northeast Asia, 15 or so thousand years ago, depending on uh, how you feel about early coastal colonizations. Oops, sorry, sorry. Uh, 15,000 years ago into the Americas. The Americas are populated last out of all of these large continental spaces. So how did these movements actually affect human skin? One of the things, there, well, there are a few things that are important here. The first is that people are diversifying within Africa and they're entering areas in far northern and far southern Africa that are relatively low in ultraviolet radiation. So within Africa, we get diversification of skin tones. And then when populations start to leave Africa and go into South and Southeast Asia, and especially into Europe and Central, uh, Central Asia, they are entering 
areas of very low annual average ultraviolet radiation and very seasonal ultraviolet radiation. And this has tremendous effects on their physiology. Ultraviolet radiation is mostly bad. And those of you who go to the dermatologist and have little bits frozen off of your body are told all the time that ultraviolet radiation is bad for you and you need to cover up. It causes damage to DNA that causes skin cancer. It also affects folate metabolism. The one good thing that ultraviolet radiation does, and specifically ultraviolet B radiation, the medium wavelength form, is that it begins the process of catalyzing vitamin D production in the skin. And vitamin D is as essential to life as is folate. What happens if you live, let's say, in Philadelphia in the wintertime? UVC coming down here, UVB, oh, this is, this is still at the equator. Sorry, I meant to have another slide in here, UVA. In the winter in Philadelphia, what you would see is the UVB does not actually make it to the Earth's surface because the UVB is coming at such an oblique angle from the sun that it's, that it's completely being absorbed by atmospheric oxygen and ozone. In other words, the sun hasn't changed, but our orientation to the sun has changed. Therefore, UVB is mostly absorbed and can't make it to the Earth's surface. Today was a beautifully sunny day in Philadelphia, but you could stand outdoors all day and not make any vitamin D in your skin because there was no UVB in the sunlight. And this had a profound effect on all populations entering into far northern habitats like this one. These two guys, who are very, very similar in, in every aspect of their anatomy, even down to the sunglasses and their age, uh, on a sunny day in the summer, they make very different amounts of vitamin D in their skin. Or more accurately, they make vitamin D at very different rates. The man on the right makes it at a rate five to six times faster than the man on the left. The man on the left is perfectly adapted to areas of very intense solar radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and the melanin, the eumelanin pigment, is going to absorb and scatter most of the harmful UV rays, allowing just small amounts of UVB to penetrate. Darkly pigmented people who are out in the sun all the time, like my friends working with me in the field at Lake Turkana in Kenya, make vitamin D in their skin with no problem if they are outdoors long enough. If they are not outdoors for a long enough period of time, then they cannot. And you can see where we're going here. In the absence of adequate vitamin D, we have real problems with survival. Vitamin D deficiency began to be recognized first as a problem related to the health of the skeleton. Rickets became well known in the 18th and 19th centuries, and its relationship to vitamin D, per se, became well established by the early 20th century, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We now know that rickets is caused by vitamin D deficiency so that bones, developing bones, cannot uh, bring in or uh, they cannot bring the calcium from an individual's diet into the developing lattice of the bone. So the bones, the long bones of the body, bow under the body's weight. The pelvis of young women is deformed and women with severe nutritional rickets cannot give normal birth. So here we see again the sword of natural selection falling on populations with severe vitamin D deficiency. In recent decades, other functions of vitamin D, uh, other functions of vitamin D, 
other than those related to calcium and phosphorus transport and uptake have been recognized. These are the ones related mostly here to skeletal health. We now know that vitamin D is essential for the health of the immune system and that it helps to regulate cell growth and proliferation. So when your doctor is telling you, oh my goodness, your vitamin D levels are very low, you must do something about it, they're thinking about your global health, not only the health of your bones, but also the health of your immune system and the, the health of, your, of, of your, the whole cellular growth and especially the, uh, the, the controllers of cell proliferation in your body. There are vitamin D receptors on virtually every organ in the human body. Vitamin D is essential for our survival. And many of us who live in urban environments today are very, are very highly vitamin D deficient. My former graduate student illustrates the sort of epitome of lightly pigmented or more properly depigmented European skin that is the product of evolution to sun that has only seasonal and low levels of ultraviolet B radiation. When humans dispersed into Eurasia and specifically into high latitudes in northwestern Europe and northeastern Asia, they had no choice but to undergo loss of pigmentation in order to survive under the highly seasonal and attenuated solar regimes that prevailed there. there. These mutations were present in the population, mutations that allowed depigmented skin to develop. If those mutations hadn't been there, those populations could not have survived. This is a classic case of evolutionary luck of the draw. The mutations were there that allowed depigmented skin to develop. Those depigmented people had greater reproductive success, and we see their genes undergoing what is called a selective sweep. The pigmentation genes are strongly selected for by natural selection, and the population quickly converts from one pigmentation regime to another. The biology and the genomics of skin pigmentation has been well studied and continues to be well studied at Penn State and many other universities. In the last 10 years, our knowledge about this has grown prodigiously and absolutely fascinatingly. When you look at these two women, both with lightly pigmented or depigmented skin, you think, oh yeah, they had a common ancestor. Yeah, makes sense, they're both depigmented. One of the really fun things that has been discovered is that the extreme degrees of depigmentation that evolved in both of these human lineages going to different parts of the Eurasian continent evolved independently from different genetic mutations. As an evolutionary biologist, it just doesn't get any more interesting than that. When you can get populations of humans undergoing convergent evolution under the same selective regimes, this is really amazing. And similarly, darkly pigmented skin and highly tannable skin has evolved more than once. Not only did we as ancestral homo sapiens and as African people have darkly pigmented skin, but as populations migrated out of Africa and then back into highly sunny regions, they re-evolved dark pigmentation, often in the form of extremely, extremely competent tanning abilities. And so we see lots and lots of human populations that have darkly pigmented skin for genetic reasons that are slightly different than the original 
African configuration. And this story is just in the process of being told genetically. And we will see much more on this and the study also of repigmentation and tanning abilities in the new world, among new world populations, is just being understood. We now know that there are dozens, actually 120 plus genes that influence human pigmentation. And what is so interesting here is that evolution works on the luck of the draw. Many mutations can affect different parts of the pigmentation pathway. So you don't just have to have a mutation in one part of the, of, on one gene affecting one part of the pathway. There are many ways to get to a final end point of skin color by modifying different parts of the pathway. And so these different genes that have contributed to dark pigmentation and tanning and depigmentation have been of greater and lesser importance in different populations. So we can really see that skin pigmentation has been a beautiful evolutionary compromise that emphasizes photoprotection around the equator and photosynthesis of vitamin D closer to the poles, a beautiful natural dual Klein system. And very, very importantly is that because similar skin colors evolved independently multiple times under similar environmental conditions, skin color becomes a marvelous example of the evolutionary process on humans, but an incredibly bad label for any particular group because you can have people who are dark, people who are light, who are related or unrelated. In other words, skin color becomes a very poor classifier of human groups or races. And even more important, or equally important, is the fact that skin pigmentation, for the most part, skin pigmentation genes are not related to genes or do not travel with genes for other traits. They're completely independent of traits for uh, facial morphology, head shape, hair form, and to some extent, eye color. In other words, skin pigmentation and all of these other superficial traits of humans evolved independent of one another on their own timetables for different reasons. They don't travel together in packages that have been in the past called races. Humans have had a loose foot. And in the last 2,000 years, especially in the last 500 years, people have started moving around tremendously at increasing distances at ever faster paces over land than by sea, now by air. We can travel dozens of degrees of latitude in just a few hours. We can go on vacation. Our ancestors never went on a vacation anywhere. They stayed home within a few tens of kilometers, generally, of where they were born. So our lifestyle, with these lavish amounts of travel and migration and voluntary movement, is a very, very new phenomenon. And what we are seeing now are many people who are living under conditions, skin conditions, to which they're inherently poorly suited. Their skin and their solar conditions don't match. And one of the biggest mismatches is those of us in this auditorium right now, because most of us, for the last 100 years, have been living in cities, indoors. And this is the biggest mismatch of all. I'll get to that in a moment. So we have voluntary migrations, and we have the world's biggest involuntary migration that resulted in many people, darkly pigmented people from equatorial Africa, ending up in Europe, but especially ending up in uh, northern parts of North America and in parts of South America, indoors, sometimes outdoors, often, uh, where in environments where there was relatively little sun. In other words, in this biggest uh, involuntary migration of history, we have a tremendous, at least some, 
descendants who are experiencing the mismatch between their skin pigmentation and their area of ancestry. And we see all around us in the city of Philadelphia, this picture is from New York, in all the major cities of the world, we have now people from all over the world living there, living under conditions to which they are inherently poorly suited from a solar perspective. And as I mentioned, cities are polluted, crowded, uh, and most of us now are not spending our times hunting and gathering or even engaging in agriculture. We live in indoor environments like this. We wear concealing clothing most of the time. We have very little to do with the sun. And this has changed our biology fundamentally. Skin pigmentation is a beautiful uh, example of natural selection acting on the human body. And I tell my, my biology teacher friends and college professor friends, I say, use this as an example of natural selection when you're teaching your students about evolution. This is a great example, and it's on your own body. How easy is that? This is really something to take home. And this is something, even if you're not a teacher, you can talk about it in your own home, to your own families. This beautiful, exquisite rainbow of color has been classified by humans. We see in the West the rise of classification of skin color beginning in the mid-18th century, uh, famously with uh, Carl Linnaeus, who in his first edition and up through his sixth edition, he very simply uh, classified four varieties of humans, Europeans, Americans, Asians, and Africans, according to color only. That was the singular attribute. Europeans were white, Americans were red, Asians were brown, Africans were black. This was 1748. By 1758, a mere decade later, Linnaeus had been in touch with many other explorers and other naturalists who had told him about other traits of humans. And so Lin Linnaeus, being a voracious ca uh, classifier and cataloger, added these traits to his list. So here in his uh, revised list of human varieties, Americans were not only red, but they were choleric, and they had black hair, and so he, uh, so he goes on to describe at some length here a series of physical attributes, but also attributes of temperament, just like Avicenna had done centuries before, bringing back the climatic theory that not only did humans vary in their appearance, but they varied in their temperament, and that this was related to environmental parameters. Europeans were white, but they were sanguine. Asians were brown and melancholy, and Africans were black and phlegmatic. So we have these characteristics of temperament that become part of the biological description of humans. Significantly, Linnaeus did not place humans in different species or in a hierarchy. He simply recognized that there were different varieties. Immanuel Kant, however, was an avid reader of Linnaeus, and he had very strong feelings about color. And this is where color comes to have value, where the sepia rainbow stops being a neutral palette of human diversity and comes to be a valued palette. Immanuel Kant, who famously traveled very little but thought a lot and thought a lot about the way people looked and why they looked the way they did, he reasoned that humans at varying distances from the sun had different capacities for developing civilization. And he attached distinct moral characterization to physical differences. And he considered some races not just 
different but inferior. And he classified these races according to color as well as other parameters. Kant, well, let's just put it this way. We live in his shadow. Kant was an extremely highly respected philosopher of the mid-18th century. He was widely read during his lifetime. Soon after his death, he was even more widely read. Students of Kant existed and thrived throughout Europe and the Americas in the 19th and 20th centuries. Kant was lionized, and many of his ideas, although they were hotly debated, like his ideas about human diversity, were hotly debated at the time. Many of Kant's ideas triumphed over competing ideas because they were promulgated by Kant himself. And so his idea that humans exist in races, and he used that word for the first time, Rassen in German, that humans exist in races and that there is a hierarchy of race, this is traceable to Kant. And my, to my apologies to all you Jefferson lovers, because Jefferson, we know now, had a very mixed history. Uh, an avid natural historian, an avid philosopher and writer, a, a, a polymath. But he also had feet of clay. He was a man of his time. And when he contemplated skin pigmentation and its meaning, what he wrote, this unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. Talking about African slaves, of course, including his own. So we have Kant, Jefferson, highly persuasive, highly articulate men who have tremendous influence in writing and in person over uh, their fellow scholars, promulgating a hierarchy of color that white, especially light Europeans, are superior and that dark, especially black Africans, are inferior. What we have done, and this is a, a branch of our own work that I've been working on with, uh, with my husband, George Chaplin, we've been actually looking at the evolution of rhetoric and color-based rhetoric after the slave trade. A very fascinating study this has been. Suffice it to say, what we see is that after the abolition of the slave trade, the formal abolition in the UK and then in the Americas, in the... Uh, early and then mid 19th century, we see the demand for slaves increased, especially in North America, the price of slaves increased. And in order to keep the slave trade going, it was important to demean Africans as much as possible, to make them into subhumans so that there would be less opposition to slavery. Certainly you can enslave people who by definition are inferior. And the biblical proponents of slavery put the connection or made the connection very strongly between darkness and the devil and goodness and white. This was a pernicious connection that has tremendous tenacity even today. And we see in this 1843 uh, book on the defense of slavery, the Bible defense of slavery by Hosea Priest, this uh, very, very inflammatory book in which he lays out this so-called so scientific argument as well as a biblical defense for the positions of the various races and especially the inferiority of Africans and their slave worthiness. In 1857, another adherent of the biblical uh, defense of slavery writes, apart from scripture authority, natural history reveals the same facts in regard to the Negro that the Bible does. The white species having qualities denied to the black 
one with a free and the other with a servile mind, one with a thinking and reflective being, the other a, uh, the other a creature of feeling and imitation, almost void of reflective faculties, and consequently unable to provide for food and take care of himself. This incredible, incendiary rhetoric denying humanity and indicating that servility of darkly pigmented people was the only permissible course. The biblical connection between darkness and evil and lightness and good actually traces to pre-Christian Zoroastrian philosophy, where the uh, when we look at compilations of Zoroastrian readings, we can see that the supreme is that which they call the endless light or white, and the abyss, that which is endlessly dark. This polarity becomes grafted onto the interpretation of the Bible erroneously and then becomes grafted onto American history. And what I've developed here is, is a nice, what I think is a nice and sensible flow sheet. We have race definitions that are associated with valued color. Color is no longer neutral. Color has a social and civilization value. These lead to specific racial stereotypes and in turn to what I call color memes color shortcuts that, that are with us, that have been with us in the United States and in much of the world for the last 200 years. And this leaves us with a very, very strong psychosocial template for racism. These stereotypes and memes and this template are not things that people are inherently born with. We notice difference because we are visual animals. We are visual primates and we notice fine gradations in skin color, hair color, all sorts of physical features. But we know from early animals, annals of human history that interactions between peoples of different colors was not based on color and had no pejorative overtone that was related to color. People in the ancient world were enslaved regardless of color. It is only very recent in history that we have become color-oriented in the modern color hierarchy sense, and especially in the United States that we've developed this binary association of light and dark, white and black. A binary association that continued through our census tracts until quite a few, just a few decades ago, and that continues in much of modern day literature and news reporting. This is the kind of thing that many of us have been brought up with. The, the idea that, well, people look different, and golly, they must, they must act different because they look different. This is not based on any scientific facts that can be demonstrated. This is based on a cultural tradition, and one, the, a poisoned tradition that we have carried from Kant and Jefferson and continued to cultivate and fertilize in this country to the present day. My point is that this is a tradition that, like any other, can be unlearned. And the reason that it's important for these traditions to be unlearned is that when people think that a hierarchy exists in their mind, then it exists for them. If they feel that they are superior or inferior because of their color or any other physical or other characteristic, if they feel that that is true, then it will be true for them and it will be predictive of their future outcomes. And this is the pernicious, the most pernicious aspect of race classifications, hierarchical classifications, and the use of race terms, is that these become predictive of individual destiny. Can we 
as Angelica Das wrote so influentially on her website, return to colors beyond the borders of our codes? I think we can. I think we can, and I think we can fight, all of us can fight racism through the tools of educating our children in informal and formal environments in our everyday interactions with one another. Skin color is beautiful. I have enjoyed studying it. I've been helped by many people, including my husband George, my research assistant Tess, funding agencies too numerous to mention, but here listed, discussions with many people. For those of you who are interested, I, uh, I've given sort of a short pricey of my book in this lecture, but those of you who want to dig deeper and get more facts can do so by reading my book or, you know, buying even a used copy on Amazon. It's going to be a lot cheaper than the one in the back of the hall. <laughs> so, but anyway, my point is that we can learn about the evolution of skin pigmentation, understand why we have this beautiful variegated rainbow of skin colors. We can understand how we came to think about skin as having social value, and then think about what a beautiful world it once again will be when we see the sepia rainbow without value. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Jumons. That was, that was really very cool. Um, I had a, I had sort of two questions that are sort of yes. related. Uh, so do you think possibly that humans uh, that just didn't have the ability to uh, alter, you know, they didn't have the alleles necessary to have selection and work on them, maybe tried to leave Africa and, and they're just, they just, there's no record of them because there weren't enough of them? Yes, uh, I mean, that's, that's the short answer. The longer answer is humans, as they dispersed out of Africa and out of uh, less seasonal solar regimes, faced a whole host of challenges, UV, temperature, and so there were many things that people had to adapt to. Populations either had to make genetic or cultural adjustments or both. I didn't talk a lot about the cultural adjustments I can do. But those, especially in the early phases of dispersal, 50,000 years ago or so, those populations who could not or who did not have the genetic background, the mutations that allowed them to, to survive under reduced light and reduced UV conditions would not have been able to survive unless they had a lot of vitamin D in their diet. We know now that there were some odd populations. Have you heard of these Denisovan populations? Yes. Uh, the Denisovans may have had darkly or moderately pigmented skin. We don't know what they ate, but given where they lived in northern Eurasia, they would have had to have eaten a highly vitamin D rich diet in order to survive there. There's no doubt that either you have to have depigmented skin or a almost exclusively sort of vitamin D oriented diet uh, in order to survive. And in many populations, like the native peoples of northern Scotland and the uh, northern Scandinavia, you have both depigmented genes, as it were, and a vitamin D-rich diet as well. But if you don't have the genes, uh, basically, I think that would have been sort of a, not a death sentence, but you would have had much less reproductive success. Your group would have been smaller and more vulnerable and likely to have become extinct. And then, and then so sort of related, so do you think that um, the skin color, because of this, you can, the depigment, depigment, depigmentation mm -hmm. selection, and then repigmentation selection. Yeah. Do you think skin color is just a highly mutable set of genes? It is. I mean, you've got 120 sets of genes that can affect the pigmentation pathway. And if you have a depigmented population that starts dispersing into a very sunny location, 
then there's going to be strong selective pressure to, to increase pigmentation. Now, interestingly, there are some populations that evolved cultural variations, but most populations that dispersed into, redispersed into high UV regimes 20, 30, and 40,000 years ago, and I'm thinking here the Indian subcontinent, especially the southern part of the Indian subcontinent, these individuals uh, underwent strong selection for repigmentation, as did Native Americans going into Mexico and South America. And what we see there, especially in, in the Americas, are tanning genes that are turned on that are different from the dark pigmentation genes that we see in the old world. And these tanning genes do the job. By the time individuals are older, uh, sort of teenage reproductive age, they have a uh, their skin is, their exposed skin is strongly tanned. If you think about Bolivian Highlanders and some Peruvian Highlanders, they have a different suite of pigmentation genes, tanning genes, that imparts dark pigmentation to them. So it's a highly labile system, and pigmentation evolution has been incredibly important as a uh, in the loss of pigmentation and the regaining of pigmentation in human history. And I'm not a genomicist, but I'm watching sort of every genomics paper as it comes out because this is very exciting times. Um, hi. Um, your talk was just absolutely fascinating. And I'm actually working on a book right now about skin color differences in nuclear families. Yeah. So um, this question, it's almost quite similar, but it's on a much more you know, mm. much smaller scale. Um, can you talk just a little bit about how, you know, you're, you, everything I've read, I, I, nobody can really explain why there's such variation in skin colors in a single family yeah. where everybody's made from the same, you know, two parts, yes. right? So how can you just talk a little bit about that, how yes. that diversity and, happens? Yes, and you're, and you're right. It's sort of related to this, qu right. the previous question insofar as, um, we have many different alleles, many different genes that contribute to skin color diversity. And in any given family, and especially in the United States, we have such genetically admixed people who are having children. And so these genetically admixed people are going to have a variety of skin pigmentation genes and the offspring, on average, will look sort of halfway between the parents. But there's going to be tremendous variation within a family because all these different alleles will play different roles in different individuals, depending on the process of recombination during the formation of eggs and sperm. So these it's sort of like genetic roulette with every... With every uh, a reproductive event. And so some individuals will come out lighter, some darker, some looking more like one parent, more like another, and some looking like a great grandparent. So it's, it is almost impossible to predict with precision what offspring are going to look like because there are so many genes involved. Once I met an Eskimo, I was charmed mm. by the color of that Eskimo woman's skin. Yeah. It seemed to me there was a certain olive tinge to it. Yes. And while you're answering that question, tell me about freckles, especially in those who are of Irish descent. Yes. Yes, two good questions about Eskimos and freckles. The Eskimo question, is, is fascinating because here we have this population of modern people living at very high latitude. They migrated into this, into this area. I mean, they, they were from a central, north central Asian homeland. They stayed in very high latitudes. They migrated into coast, the coastal part of the Bering Strait in both Asia and North America. And so here we have these people who by rights should be very, very, very lightly pigmented. And instead, you have people who have prodigious tanning ability. 
when you look at the unexposed areas of an Eskimo's body, the armpit area, what you see is moderately pigmented, lightly to moderately pigmented skin. But when exposed to ultraviolet radiation and in the circumpolar environment, there is a lot of UVA radiation. Very little UVB, but a lot of UVA. And the UVA is direct and it's reflected off of the surface of the snow and ice. So people actually get Inuit uh, Eskimos get a tremendously high UV load. They were able to, as I, as I say, buy their way out of having dark skin under no UVB by having a diet composed almost exclusively of vitamin D rich food sources, marine mammals, oily fish, things like uh, walrus, seals, narwhal, these, these kinds of foods are tremendously vitamin D rich. And as long as they eat vitamin D rich foods, they will, they will be very, very healthy. And we have sadly quite a, a, a bad natural experiment going on right now because lots of Inuit people no longer are able to eat their traditional foods. They can't hunt their traditional foods. They're eating corned beef and McDonald's. And as a result, getting vitamin D deficiencies, and a concatenated host of other medical problems, very, very severe problems. So that, that's, that's the answer to the first question. The freckle question, freckles are accumulations of melanin-producing cells that we see in uh, lightly pigmented Europeans. And we see also in a few lightly pigmented Asians, but they're mostly a European phenomenon. They are evoked by sun exposure early in development. So you often see kids who have a lot of freckles across the bridge of their nose. And they develop as a response to some initial sun exposure. Mostly, they regress during life. So kids who have freckles often will lose most of their freckles or all of their freckles by the time they're adults. Sometimes they stay, especially if someone is repeatedly getting a lot of sun exposure. So I have, I have a friend who lives in East Africa who is from a, a very freckled northern European stock, and he has freckles all over his body because he's constantly exposed to high UV. Sadly, those freckles are not very good for you because the accumulation of pheomelanin, yellow melanin, actually conduces to the formation of free radicals that cause precancerous changes in the skin. So I sometimes call freckles skin cancer factories because when sunlight impinges on them, they produce pheomelanin, they produce free radicals that cause pre-malignant changes in skin cells. So freckles are like the canary in the coal mine telling you to stay out of the sun. Yeah, there was a question right in front there that he's been very patient. Yes. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, I'm thinking now of the uh, overworked and unhelpful phrase about a post-racial society. Oh, and now we learn that there was a pre-racist society. <laughs> And you, you put this entire onus on Kant, but it had to, ideas like that yes. always emerge from a constellation of pernicious people or yes. whatever. But what were these sort of cultural memes about race prior to this time you're talking about? Because that would be an interesting area yes. of research in terms of trying to capture something a little more uh, humane. Yes. And in fact, there has been a... a uh, it's a great question. There's been a lot of scholarship done on this. And uh, a scholar named Frank Snowden wrote you know, a, a series of very good books and papers about the meaning of color in the, in the ancient Mediterranean world. And his thesis, and he draws upon many, many sources, scriptural, philosophical, and other sources, um, basically that people recognized difference but did not attach values to skin pigmentation so that you could have a white slave, a black slave, a brown slave, 
it, or you know, people of very high status who were of any color. But one of the things that is so pronounced in the ancient world is that people did have sort of a sense, they, they did have a very deep sense of cultural prejudice that we would call racism today. The Greeks knew that the Greek culture was supreme and that people who did not speak Greek and who did not enjoy Greek culture were inferior by definition, the Romans similarly. So we have racism very strongly installed in these classic cultures as, as well as others that are less well uh, recorded in literature. Cultural preferences based on you know, absence of, of language and cultural practice. Only much later do we see color being assigned to value. And this is fascinating. So we have, you know, we have people with culture, we have barbarians of various kinds who are, who are inferior by definition because they lack our language and lack our culture. And then in different parts of the world at different times, people with different color also go into this category. So I think that, that is a wonderful example of just how plastic a system this is and that the influence of highly regarded people, scholars in the ancient world, can have tremendous influence over how people are schooled, how people think about difference uh, in the military, for instance, and, and these relatively few well-educated people with inordinate amounts of influence can, can channel the cultural conditioning of large populations and lead to racist attitudes or not racist attitudes. A field of hands. I was wondering if you were familiar with the gentleman that wrote the book, Black Like Me. Yes. And he was white and he turned himself black. Yes. And I was wondering, how was that possible? Um, I know I, as a kid, I was about the color of the podium or even darker. Mm -hmm. And my, I come from grandparents who were black, mm -hmm. but I've gotten lightened over the years. So I'm wondering, can, it, you, know, can you reverse that process? Yeah. The, uh, the man in Black Like Me actually took a compound, now illegal, uh, that, uh, that created dark pigmentation that caused his skin to produce more melanin so that he could simulate the look of a much sort of a permanently very darkly tanned individual. So he undertook this sort of natural experiment himself because he wanted to see what it felt like and he wrote, you know, a very, very powerful book that had tremendous influence. Your own personal experience is fascinating because as we get old, regardless of, of what our original color was, we get lighter with age. So even if we're getting some sun exposure, casual sun exposure, we will tend to get lighter because our melanin producing cells become less active. You are lighter now probably because you're not out in the sun as much, but also because you're that much lighter. Uh, older than you were as a youth. So we naturally fade with age. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to use a pejorative term, but you know, I, I know I'm much lighter than I used to be. And, and my mother, who, when she died, was much lighter than when she was a young woman who had very dark olive skin. So that's a natural aging process of skin. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, in living in, in rural Tanzania for several years, I found that even there, there is this value preference for lighter skin. And that, does that still go back to Jefferson and Kant? Well, this, and this is fascinating because in Africa today, and for the last 
150 years, there has been a tremendous influence of sort of the colonial mentality and the, the European color hierarchy. And there's lots of question as to, you know, in the past, before European contact, what did people think about color? There's no evidence that there was anything of a color hierarchy in, in traditional African societies before European contact. Although in agricultural groups across the world, including in Africa, people of high status who could afford to stay inside and who didn't have tanned skin or darker skin were always of higher status. So in African agricultural groups, people who stayed inside and who lived privileged, more privileged lives were considered superior. So in that way, there was a subtle but not colonially related hierarchy. Today, the, we, we have this unfortunate colonial sort of a Kant Jefferson mindset that has been transported very effectively to Africa and that has been, I should say, potentiated and magnified by the purveyors of skin bleaching products who show many glamorous advertisements of women and men uh, looking happier because they've lightened their skin. Skin bleaching is one of the most pernicious practices. It started in the American South 150 plus years ago, but it has gone throughout the world and has become one of the most serious problems that is besetting Africa and uh, East Asia and India. People want to be lighter because they think it's going to get them a better job, get them a better marriage partner, get them a better life. And so people who can sell skin lightening products convincingly are making a lot of money. So we're, we're reaping the very sad rewards of this color hierarchy in ramifying negative ways. What about in the Middle East? The Arabs there are darker complected and they invaded an area where I believe there were lighter complected people including Chaldeans, Samaritans, Assyrians, Kurdish, etc. And how, how is ra uh, the color seen in that area? And didn't the Arabs also enslave some white people? And then secondly, in, in World War II, what, what about the Japanese treatment of white people? In, yeah, this is, a, these are fascinating questions. Firstly, one of the things that's fascinating about the, the peopling of the Arabian Peninsula is that Homo sapiens, after using as a, as a transit zone 60 to 70,000 years ago, it wasn't fully populated again until about 4,000 years ago. And the peoples who came into the Arabian Peninsula, mostly from Europe, were lightly pigmented, who had some tanning abilities, and who used cultural mechanisms to protect themselves from the sun. So you have people who are capable of tanning, but they're using a lot of different covering devices, personal covering devices, as well as, as large cloth tents uh, to live under to protect themselves from the sun. I will be honest with you, I don't know a lot about attitudes toward color among peoples on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but if they are like other agricultural and broadly Bedouin populations, they will see a hierarchy and they will pref there will be some preference for lighter skin pigmentation, especially in women, especially in women. The, the question about uh, Japanese in World War II is fascinating because when Japanese were drawing cartoons, and this is one of the best ways to see sort of what the temperature of skin color is in any culture, is look at how they depict people in cartoons. Japanese people would depict themselves in cartoons during World War II as being very light but they would depict others 
including Americans, as being much darker. And of course, our iconography tended to be just the opposite. So, so they have always, the, the Japanese have always seen themselves as the white race in Japanese language, the, the pure white race. And so their depictions during World War II emphasized their, even though they may have had darker skin, the, the characterizations showed them as, as white, sort of as this inner value coming to the surface, this purity of, of experience and philosophy that was superior to the darker, tarnished colors of other races and peoples.